Good morning, I'm Morgan and I'm the ministerial intern here at Timberlake Christian Church and I'll be your worship leader for today. Um, so first we have announcements and um, first we have um, Ben's Facebook Lives. Um, Monday through Thursday at 1.43 p.m. They usually last about 10 to 15 minutes and it's a great and fun way to connect with each other um, during our busy weeks. Next, we're hosting a Lent Word of the Day challenge. So each day we will share a word and a picture that goes with the word on the Facebook page. And we would love for you to join us um, as we go through Lent. Um, you can participate in as many days as you like or as few. Um, but if you do, um, please use the hashtag Lent Word of the Day and tag us at TCCDOC um if you do post um the weekly bible study is held on tuesdays at 10 a.m and thursdays at 8 p.m through zoom um both sessions are the same so you can choose whichever one works for your schedule better and for this current study we're looking uh, more deeply into the scripture readings used uh, for the sunday service each week um, the social justice team is planning a Be the Church Day for this spring, and Be the Church Day is a Sunday where instead of um, worshiping in the church building like we usually do on a Sunday, we go out into the community, um, and it's a good opportunity to uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and um, it's an excellent way to build community with each other, um, like within the church and uh, with the people in the community where we live. Um, so if you know anyone who, um, and like an individual or like an organization or an agency, uh, they could use volunteer work for a day. Um, please send a message here on Facebook or email the church. Uh, the email is tcc at tccdoc.org. Um, this week, um, on Wednesday at 5.15, there will be a kid Zoom meeting and it's a short meeting um, online on Zoom. And um, any kids in the congregation um, get together, hang out for um, a little bit and do some fun stuff. So if you're interested in that, the link will be in the newsletter, I believe. Um, or you can also email the church and we'll send it to you. And finally, our annual Easter egg hunt will be held April 9th at 1 p.m. And the rain date for that is April 16th at the same time, um, 1 p.m. So if you're in the area, we would love for you to bring your kids or your grandkids or any kids you know that'll be interested. Um, we would love to have you join us for a fun afternoon. The people on this week's prayer list are Carter Lane, brother of Catherine and Gizzi, um, David Brown, friend of Jimmy and Kay Green, Wanda Gardner, Reverend Bill Oliver, who is Scott Oliver's father, um, Hannah Troxell in the death of her mother-in-law, Clara Conrad, Kenny Blankenship, who is Nancy Jamerson's brother-in-law, um, and Larry Johnson, who is Teresa Graham's brother-in-law. So if you will keep these people in your prayers this week and as we pray together. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for this day and for our time together. We're grateful for all the ways that we're able to fellowship with each other. Please be with us as we experience whatever the day brings. Thank you for being with us in our joy and celebration as well as our grief and struggles. We know you care deeply about everything that we feel. Help us to keep dreaming for a world of abundance in the midst of scarcity. Help us to keep dreaming of collectivism, not individualism. May we not only dream, but work towards a space where everyone is welcome, celebrated, and affirmed regardless of ability, gender, race, or sexuality. We lift up those mentioned on the prayer list as well as those who are in our hearts. Please join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gospel reading for today comes from Luke 13, 31 through 35. At that time, some Pharisees approached Jesus and said, go, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, go tell that fox, look, I'm throwing out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will complete my work. However, it's necessary for me to travel today, tomorrow and the next because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. How often I have wanted to gather your people just as a hen gathers her chick under her wings. But you didn't want that. Look, your house is abandoned. I tell you, you won't see me until the time comes when you say, blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. The Old Testament reading for today comes from Genesis 15, 1 through 18. After these events, the Lord's word came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your protector. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you possibly give me since I have no children? The head of my household is Eliezer, a man from Damascus. He continued, since you haven't given me any children, the head of my household will be my heir. The Lord's word came immediately to him. This man will not be your heir. Your heir will definitely be your own biological child. Then he brought Abram outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars if you think you can count them. He continued, This is how many children you will have. Abram trusted the Lord, and the Lord recognized Abram's high moral character. He said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram said, Lord God, how do I know that I will actually possess it? He said, bring me a three-year-old female calf, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. He took all of these animals, split them in half, and laid the halves facing each other, but he didn't split the birds. When vultures swooped down on the carcasses, Abram waved them off. After the sun set, Abram slept deeply. A terrifying and deep darkness settled over him. The Lord said to Abram, have no doubt that your descendants will live as immigrants in a land that isn't their own, where they will be oppressed slaves for 400 years. But after I punish the nation they serve, they will leave it with great wealth. As for you, you will join your ancestors in peace and be buried after a long, good life. The fourth generation will return here since the Amorites' wrongdoing won't have reached its peak until then. After the sun had set and darkness had deepened, a smoking vessel with a fiery flame passed between the split open animals. That day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I give this land, from Egypt's river to the great Euphrates. Great pay and you can create your own schedule. Read those words when I was in my mid twenties. I was um, trying to get myself straightened out financially, and it sounded perfect. I didn't need a full time income. I was working as a youth minister in Texas, and all I really needed was the flexibility to schedule myself around my my job and also some extra income. I had a car payment, I had rent to pay, and a number of other things that I needed to be able to pay for. Um, I had found myself out of school and needed that income. I had been working as a server uh, at a local restaurant, but that wasn't quite getting me to the point I wanted to be financially. And at the same time, it didn't have that kind of flexibility. They were scheduling me. They were willing to let me say week by week I didn't work on Sundays or on Wednesday evenings when I had youth activities, but otherwise I was at their beck and call. So I read those words, and of course I, as a uh, impulsive mid-20 male, um, ran off to the job. 
it was selling Cutco knives. I don't know how many of you have experience with Cutco knives, but they really are good knives. Uh, I have a scar on my thumb to prove it. But selling them is not as easy as they make it sound, and it's not really on your own schedule either. It was one of those things that I probably should have known was too good to be true. Great money? Yeah, if you're willing to manipulate your friends and family members and work really hard and schedule yourself nonstop, you can get to the point of making great money, but it's not going to be quick. The reality is, is you have to be willing to meet with everybody you know and try to convince them to spend what is quite a lot of money on knives that, while they are fantastic, probably aren't anything they need. So you're trying to convince your, your friends to spend money they don't have on a luxury. I was not very good at it. I also wasn't very good at getting my friends once they had sat through my spiel to give me new leads. I didn't want to push them to help me get to know their friends and ask their friends to help. And so as anybody who has any sense probably could have seen from the beginning of the story, it didn't work out very well. I did not sell very many knives. I did not make very much money. And within a couple months, I let that go. But it seemed so perfect. And that's the thing is when we dream a lot in our world, our dreams have to fit within the functioning of our world, the functioning of our society. And so they have to be narrow dreams. They have to be specific dreams and they have to be perfect dreams. If any little detail isn't under our control and isn't gonna go exactly the way we need it to, those dreams, they'll get snuffed out. In this morning's gospel lesson, the disciples, if we put ourselves in their shoes for a moment, might be feeling like, uh-oh, these dreams that we have, the dreams that we got from this man, Jesus, are they going to get snuffed out? Is this going to go bad on us? Is this going to go south? Are we about to be in trouble? We've thrown our lives away. We have given up everything to follow him. And the Pharisees have shown up to say, hey, Herod's looking to kill you. And Jesus doesn't seem real concerned. Because the disciples dream within the world as it is. We can miss out on exactly how scary this must have been for the disciples and how scary it could have been for Jesus himself. Herod, the son of Herod the Great, had already had John the Baptist executed. There was no doubt that he could do some work. That if it was his desire to kill someone, they were probably going to end up dead. That's the way this world works. The rulers get to decide who lives and who dies. Our world may seem different sometimes, but we see it playing out in the news where those who have power, who have control over armies, are the ones deciding whose life is valuable and whose life is worth taking. No matter how safe and secure we may feel where we are, we can see in so many situations where just a month ago, a family may have thought, yeah, we're, in a, we're okay. Nothing bad is going to happen. Now they find themselves fleeing. That's where Jesus and his disciples find themselves. And it's perfectly reasonable that he and the disciples may have felt like, gosh, this is not going right at all. Jesus's response with that little bit of humor, go tell that fox, says perfectly what it looks like to be faithful in response to the temptation to try to manipulate our dreams into reality. It had to be tempting for Jesus, and I'm sure the disciples maybe nudged him. Why don't we get out of here for a while? Let's go lay low. It's okay. We can get back to the healing and driving out of demons and, and spreading the good news, all that stuff. We can get back to it, but let's just 
take a week or a couple weeks or maybe even a month off. Let's go find somewhere to, to be quiet. We can do the solitude thing, right? Why don't we go pray? We can go away to the mountains. We'll have a retreat. It'll be great. And Herod won't be trying to kill us and Herod won't know where we are. But Jesus' faithful response says, no. Tell him I'm up to good. Tell Herod, I am casting out demons. I am healing people. I am taking care of people. I'm going to be doing that today. I'm going to be doing it tomorrow. I'm going to be doing it the next day. I don't think Jesus is saying just three more days and then he heads to Jerusalem. I think he's saying, look, this is what I'm up to right now for a period of time. And he's not going to stop me from doing that. Because Jesus sees possible dreams through faithfulness, not exact dreams that have to be manipulated and made just so for them to happen. Herod's power is taken away because Jesus knows what he is about. He's not afraid of the power that Herod has. He is not afraid of the power of death. He says it clearly. I won't die here. I'll go to Jerusalem and die. But Jesus also sees that those dreams are going to change the way the world is, change the way the world works. And so he doesn't have to fit in with the narrow, this is just the way things are, and I have to work within that framework. Instead, Jesus can say, this dream's coming through no matter what. Nothing will stop it. And I've got to be honest, there's another little hint in this story that tells us that with God, with Jesus, those dreams will change the way we see things. Our sense that things have to be the way they are. And we have to work within that framework. Because there's a little detail we can easily miss. The Pharisees came to warn Jesus. Y'all, we see the Pharisees as Jesus' enemy. We oftentimes are taught that the Pharisees are the very people who help to work for Jesus' death. But it's easy to believe that because when we see disagreement, we tend to think, oh, that's an enemy. We tend to think, oh, that's somebody who is a threat. It's easy to see those who disagree with Jesus, who challenge Jesus as the bad guys and therefore always working against Jesus. But that's not actually the way things are. The Pharisees still care for Jesus' life. They still show up to warn him, to make sure he's okay. And so in seeing that, we can start to see that glimmer of the kingdom of God showing up, of the reign of God taking place of the dream of God becoming just a little bit more real. It's not the whole thing. The work's not done. The Pharisees continue to disagree with and oppose Jesus in many ways. But in this story, they get to be the good guys too because they're nuanced, they're complex, just like any and all of us are. And so how... How do we remain faithful like Jesus remained faithful? By looking at the text from Genesis, we can be reminded. We can re be reminded that Abraham, when God was promising him all of these things, said, how do I know it's true? We can learn to be faithful as Jesus is faithful. Faithful as Abraham became faithful. By asking that question ourselves, God, you've made these promises to us. How do we know it's true? But we've got to hold loosely to that question and to what we consider an acceptable answer. In the story from Genesis this morning, I've got to be honest, as I read it, I'm not sure what God is proving, except that it is God's work. God tells Abraham to bring these animals and to divide them up. And that's all Abraham has to do. The rest of the work that is done is done by God. And so it is like God is saying, you will know it's true because I'm God. 
because I can do this and because I have promised you. And what God has told Abraham will be true is not all good news. God places a dream within Abraham that involves 400 years of enslavement and oppression and suffering for his offspring, for his great-grandchildren, right through his great-great-great-great-grandchildren. They will suffer. They will be oppressed. But all of that will lead to God's promise. How do we know it's true? When we have dreams, we can't believe that if anything goes wrong, that they won't come true. We have to trust in a God who has brought about redemption. We have to be faithful to a God who has placed those dreams within us. And we have to know that although the dreams may not end up looking exactly as we wanted them to look, they are God's dreams. So they will not be thwarted. We do not have to worry about the foxes of our world who seek to maintain power, to scare, to manipulate. Instead, we can be faithful. We can live out the good news. We can be who we are made to be. We can remember again and again and again, we are beloved children of God. And in security of that knowledge, we can go and do what we are called to do. It may not always feel like it's enough when we look at the ways in which darkness seems to be advancing. But the light of our faithfulness will continue to shine. And we've got to remember, there is no darkness that can overcome light. There is no darkness in all this world that cannot be banished by a single flame, by a single flicker, by even a little spark. And so we can be faithful to the dreams that God has placed within us, continuing to dream, continuing to explore, continuing to try to figure out what it is we are called to be, what it is we are called to do as individuals and as a congregation, a community of faith. We can continue to dream. We can continue to know that God is with us. And we don't have to give in to the temptation to make things just so. Instead, we can be faithful with the dreams God has given us. Amen. Good morning, folks. It's time for communion. And I had a trouble doing this this week. Uh, I just got tongue-tied every time I did it trying to read my notes, so I'm just going to sit here and talk with you instead of trying to read what I had. But communion, what is communion? Communion is actually a communion with Jesus. Uh, that's what it means, talking with him, getting closer to him. And, you know, it's not just step number six on the bulletin. They're supposed to get ready for communion. You're supposed to acknowledge your sins, confess your sins, and you're supposed to come to communion with a clean heart. Now, the other part of this time of year is Lent. And we're taught that Lent is a time to clean your heart, to cleanse your heart uh, and get closer to God. And remember his sacrifice. Well, how do we do that? Most of what we do is putting stuff, concerns putting stuff in our mouth. But, uh, you know, I'm gonna give up candy bars for Lent. Uh, when I was a kid, I said, hey, Dick, what are you giving up for Lent? Well, he said, I tried to give up riding my bike after school, but that didn't go over. So um, I'm giving up potato chips. I said, well, I tried giving up peas one year, and that didn't go over either. Uh, so I gave up candy. But it's usually something like that. And probably the most things that people give up is candy. And why? It's because, oh, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Well, I'm aiming for 15. Because it's getting to be summertime, got to look good in that bathing suit. Well, this is a giving up something 
for your benefit, not for God's benefit, not to make you a better Christian. Instead of giving up something we put in our mouth, how about giving up something that comes out of our mouth? You know, it's very easy to talk ill of people. And the Bible tells us over 50 times, because I gave up counting at 50, that, uh, you know, you shouldn't talk ill of people. You should be kind to people, but it's so hard. It's, that truck cuts you off, It's come, you come home and tell your family, you won't believe what that idiot did. Well, he might not be an idiot. He might be just making a mistake. Or that you come home from a meeting, you say, I don't believe what she suggested we do. I mean, I can't believe it. I know who would suggest something like that? And if you stop to think of that, maybe there's some good in that suggestion that can go in with other suggestions. Um, and then you'd become a better Christian. You know, I told you that there's like over, I stopped counting it 50 times that uh, the Bible tells us to be not talk ill of other people. And I couldn't find a single place where Jesus prefers thin people. So maybe giving up something coming out of our mouth would be a good start because then we could approach this communion table with a cleaner heart, with God being more pleased with us. So I'm going to go to prayer and I'm going to ask you to just silent pray for a few seconds or minutes and ask God to look and see if you have something in your heart that you should give up. Not just for Lent, but to become a better Christian. And maybe it is talking evil of other people. But whatever it is, ask God. And then I'll close the prayer. Lord, we come loving you and thanking you and ask you to listen to our hearts now. Lord, as we come to this communion table, we come with a thankful heart. Thank you for being such a kind, loving, forgiving God. And thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for the forgiveness of our sins. As we come to you acknowledging and confessing our sins, we ask you to help us be better Christians by being kinder to others. Help us be keenly aware when we speak ill of others so that we can all learn to look at them and speak of them as you would with your love. In doing that, we will become better Christians and able to come to this communion table with a cleaner heart and to be much more pleasing to you. Amen. The Lord Jesus, one, on a night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Lord's death until he comes. Amen. God has given us dreams. Dreams for what this church can be. What our community of faith can do here in the Timberlake area in Lynchburg. God has given us dreams for the ways in which we can impact, not just locally, but nationally and globally the ministries that we do together as a church continue to plant the seeds of those dreams and then watch them grow. And so whatever we give, 
whether it be our own dreams, those little seeds that we can plant, sharing them with each other and saying, this is what I hope to see at TCC. This is what I hope God is doing, what I believe God is doing. I believe that God has given this dream to me, to us as a community. And so we can dream together, whether we give dreams, whether we give time, whether we give talents, whether we give prayers, whether we give financially, all of those givings help those dreams, the dreams of God that have been given to us become reality, bear fruit in this world. So we give. If you have dreams you'd like to share, share them with me. I want to know what are our dreams? We, sh we started this back in May of last year. What dreams has God planted? What can we do to make them work? Let's share our dreams and then hold them loosely to see where they may go. And let's continue to do all we can to support those dreams as they grow to bearing fruit for God's reign on this earth. And now, if you will please bow for our benediction. May the seed of light and hope that God has planted in you grow and bear fruit for the world that God loves. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's get out there and give them heaven. <laughs>